Hi, everybody. Welcome to the Turo County uh, Public Library's Author Talk. Uh, and today we have a very special guest. Um, he just published his new book, The Flower Boat Girl, which is a historical fiction about the pirate queen, Chang Yi Sao. I, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. I know there's a few different pronunciations for it. Um, and she was the pirate queen of uh, Southeast Asia and probably arguably one of the most powerful uh, pirates in modern history. Um, and uh, this author, uh, he is not just an author, he's an artist, a cartoonist. He has published works in Time Magazine, The Economist, uh, uh, Fortune Magazine, The New York Times. Um, he has helped out with some shows on Cartoon Network, the Disney Channel. Um, he is widely known for his Lily Wong daily comic strips. Um, and he has spent some time in London, and currently he lives all the way on the other side of the world in Hong Kong. May I present to you, Mr. Larry Fain. Thank you so much for joining us today. Okay, thank you for, uh, thank you for uh, coming to listen to me. Um, I just want to say a little bit about, well, you already told my background, mm -hmm. but uh, I, I've been living in Hong Kong for most of the last 36 years. Wow. I came here in 1985. Um, and aside from two years elsewhere, this is where I've been living mm -hmm. and making my career. And right now I live on an outlying island called Lantau Island, mm -hmm. um, which is not very, it's very sparsely populated. I live in a little village. There's no cars here. To get into the city, I ride a bicycle to the ferry pier and take a ferry, which takes anywhere from 30 to 45 minutes to go into the city, though I don't go in much. And so, you know, you don't often associate Hong Kong with this kind of rural living, but that's that's the way I live in a in a small village of mm -hmm. uh, mostly Chinese people. And this island has a lot of history and one kind of odd thing about this place, uh, which in some ways relates to its history, is that people have not been that aware of their own history, even though it's all around them. And so it's my own fascination with that history that, um, that got me into this project. And I should also point out that I do have a North Carolina connection in that my son just married a Greensboro girl last year. So I guess I'm a uh, Carolinian in law, or I don't know how you would put it. Yeah. Fantastic. But, um, Congratulations. You got to come yeah, by and thanks. get some pulled pork. <laughs> yeah. Well, unfortunately, because of the whole COVID situation, there was the, the wedding itself was uh, postponed. They're officially married, but one of these days, yeah, they will get married. And I hope one of these days to visit their family uh, apartment in Greensboro. Because they mm -hmm. They, they do go there sometimes. Okay. But anyway, let me let me talk to you about um, the Pirate Queen. And in in Mandarin, you did you did pronounce her name correctly, which is um, Jingyi Sao. But as I'll tell you later, that's not actually her name. Yes. So let me get started with this and share my screen. Let me see if I need to do anything on my end over here. Oh, you there we go. Yep. So you can see her now, right? I can see that this, there it is. Yep. Okay. And so am I in the right place? Let me make sure. I'm not. This is where I'm supposed to be. Hold on. Sorry about that. I that experience with this. Oops. Okay. I better start that again. Sorry about that. Okay. Okay. We're starting again. Here we go. You see this? 
And yep, I see it now. Yep. Okay. All right. So what I'd like to do is start by telling you the story behind the story and how I first learned about this, this woman pirate um, who I became so fascinated with. So uh, let me introduce you here to my friend, Mr. Leung, and he's the one sitting down with a cap on. He, he uh, comes from an old sailing family, generations of, who've lived on this island for, well, he lives in a, in a community at the other end of the island called Tai-O, which is a fishing village, which is uh, hundreds of years old. And he runs this little cargo boat uh, which brings supplies uh, to my part of the island. And I've known him for many years. And so I was talking to him one day about history on Lantau Island. And he mentioned at one point that his, he remembered that his grandmother used to sing this folk ballad about this fearsome lady pirate based on, in one of the bays on this island who had stood up to the government and stood up to the navies of three empires and one. And I was really intrigued by that. I said, tell me the words. Well, he couldn't remember them. So I was immediately interested. I'd never heard of this before. So I, I looked up everywhere I could find to try to discover this folk song. That was my interest at the time. <clears throat> and I found a couple other references to it in articles that other people from, <clears throat> from, excuse me, from the same village had written, but no one had the words. No one remembered it. They just remembered an old relative singing it. And I saw a mention of it in a, in a scholarly article. Again, there were no words, but I was really intrigued. And so I started looking into her and looked online, of course, and started finding all sorts of really wild information about her and things started to bother me a little bit and so i'll i'll just go through that so if you look her up if you look up the chinese pirate queen or if you know how to how to type in the name jing yi sao then nine times out of ten you're going to see this genuine photo of her uh that appears in different articles and this is where I saw everywhere. There's always, almost always this picture of her. And something didn't quite sit right with me until, until I examined it. Now, first of all, the years that we're talking about when she was in this region, she was born in the year 1775. She was um, abducted by pirates in the year 1801 when she was 26 years old. Prior to that, she had been working as a prostitute on what are called flower boats, which I'll talk about in a bit. But so she was her reign or the, the story itself spanned the first decade of the 19th century. Now, cameras didn't come into existence, at least in this part of the world, until 1850. So one, this couldn't be a photo of her. Could it be an etching? Maybe, but there's still some things wrong with it. And so the first thing I noticed was her sword. And this is a narrow European style saber. Uh, it, you can see it has a knuckle guard and it's perfectly straight and very thin. Um, and Chinese swords just aren't like that. They don't have knuckle guards. I looked this up, they're wider. Uh, they don't taper to a point like that. They're more straight and then with a, a sharp um, leading edge. So she's not holding a Chinese sword for one thing. This style of outfit she's wearing with that, that collar that looks like a traditional Chinese Zhongsam or Qi Pao um, that first came into style in 1910, so 100 years later. Um, and the hat she's wearing is a scholar's cap, and I'll tell you in a little while why that's impossible for her. Mm -hmm. So in any case, whoever posed this 
image. I was less interested in in uh, showing a, a genuine image of her or how she may have looked than he was, say, in making a pretty Asian girl look badass. So this 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 image is totally fake. And this is more like how she might have looked, because th this is some actual photos from around 1880 of boat women. And back then in the 19th century, I don't think the fashions, there weren't really fashions that would have changed at that time. So in her day, they would have looked the same. And so you can see they wore a loose fitting smock. They had this head covering, which was used to keep off the sun, or they would drench it in water to keep their heads cool on hot days. And so the one on the left would have been kind of an everyday working outfit for a young woman. And the one on the right has a little bit more design to the head covering and a little bit more design in the, the fasteners on the smock, which would have been her, her best outfit. This, this one who's posing on the right. So this is more what she would have looked like. Um, and in fact, there really aren't any images of her from her time when she was alive. Um, no one did any sketches or anything of her that I've ever been able to find. But the closest I found is uh, a painting, a scroll painting that was done by a Chinese artist around 1835 um, about a certain battle between the Chinese pirates and the Chinese Navy. And this is an extreme close up of a small detail showing her giving orders to the other pirates. And so this artist would not have known what she looked like, but at least he was a, an artist painting, you know, within just a, a couple decades later, he would have gotten the, the outfit correct. Um, and the way her hair was, was, you know, more accurately and along with all the other characters. Yeah. More in the ballpark. That's right. Yeah. And so, I mean, it's kind of funny that I wasn't even aware of this image until even er just earlier this year. Mm -hmm. uh, it's it's a, a painting that's owned by the Hong Kong Maritime Museum, where I've been hundreds of times. Wow. And I've seen this painting so many times, but this is such a tiny detail in the corner, I'd never noticed it until one of the museum directors pointed it out to me. I said, how come you never showed me this before? But... Um, so this is this is the image they should be showing when there, there's articles about her. Mm -hmm. So this this is the first thing that led me to think maybe there's not maybe there's something not quite accurate about what I've been finding about her. Now the next thing is her name, and we just saw this image before. Now in in China there are a lot of dialects, and the dialect that's considered the official national dialect even then was what we call Mandarin. And like, like you said before, her name in Mandarin would have been known as Zheng Yi Sao. And she came from Southern China near the, well, in the, in the region where Hong Kong is, which is way down on the South coast um, in the area of Guangdong province, or what was known then in English as Canton province, where the prevailing language is Cantonese. And especially back then, the, the uh, people in Southern China would not have generally spoken Mandarin unless they were educated people or, or working for the government. And the, the whole boat people community was mostly illiterate. And so, she and her colleagues, none of them would have spoken Mandarin to each other. So her name would have been written the way it's shown here on the right. Well, on the left, let's put it that way, is her actual name, which in Cantonese would be pronounced Shek Yang. And they, the Chinese put the, the family name first. So her family name was Shek, and her given name was Yang. Uh, on the right was the title that was given to her later when she became more uh, prominent among the pirates, which which we'll, you'll find in all the articles written as Zheng Yi Sao. In Cantonese, which she would have spoken, it was Cheng Yat So. So you can see there's quite a bit of difference in the pronunciation. And so for me, as someone living in this region where Cantonese is spoken, um, it, it was kind of a, an annoyance 
to see that all of these articles that are written in English or translated into English would transliterate her name as Jung Gi Sao. And when I would uh, mention this to people, to different scholars, they would they would get annoyed at me in turn. Well, you know, Mandarin is the language of scholarly research in English, so okay, I can forgive those people. But um, often enough, I'd be corrected when I called her Cheng Yat So. And I find this kind of annoying too, because if you're going to have just a popular article about her, get the language correct. So that was, that was the next thing that kind of um, made me go uh, a little bit, uh, get very suspicious about it. Now, my background, you mentioned I was, I, I was a cartoonist for many years here, but that was never my original ambition. I went to college in Vermont, and my major was history. And I thought at back, way back then that I'm going to be either a historian or write historical fiction. And I studied under a historian who was my mentor. And he grilled into me. He, well, he taught me proper historical research techniques. And the one thing that he really drilled into me was to develop what he called the historical bullshit meter. Mm -hmm. And that was to develop that sense that you're reading a source that has something wrong with it. And so you need to delve deeper. And so I got this sense just from my knowledge of Chinese culture that things were a bit strange about some of these stories. So the general story you'll find if you look her up on just about anywhere is that she had been Either she had been working as a prostitute on one of these boats, and then by some by, by some means the this this uh, pirate captain came along and kidnapped her and demanded that she marry him, and that the moment that she was brought on board, she struck him across the face and demanded that if you want me, you're going to have to give me fifty percent share of your business and make me your partner. And this is the kind of account that you'll find when you read about her. Well, there's a lot of things wrong with that scenario. And I knew that for sure already, even from a very light reading of history. One, these flower boats where prostitutes lived um, were clients of these pirates. The pirates, many of them engaged in human trafficking. They would kidnap young women and sell them on, into sexual slavery. So they weren't about to go and jeopardize their own clients by climbing aboard a pirate boat, or a flower boat, I mean, and kidnapping young women. Uh, second, it just was completely, to me, beyond the scope of the way Chinese women in that class of people would have acted where she would have been kidnapped and immediately stood up and punched the guy. So this just didn't seem right. So what do you do when you find a, a historical source that you're a little bit suspicious of? You, you check its sources mm -hmm. and you go to whatever those sources are and you check those sources until you get back to that very original source. And that's what I finally found. It's a very original source, which was a, a document written by an amateur Chinese historian about 20 years after these pirates had left the scene. And that was all that you could find, because unlike Westerners, Chinese never uh, romanticized pirates. They were not romantic rebels. They were just criminals. And in fact, that's what they were. They were organized criminals. Mm -hmm. And so in Chinese literature, in folk tales and so on, you don't see them treated as these romantic heroes. The only exception I ever found was this elusive folk tale. Uh, I mean, folk song, I'm sorry, which I never found. But otherwise, so you wouldn't have found, and I couldn't find any stories or histories of these pirates written from a Chinese point of view, except this one that had been written 20 years after the fact. And the, the writer had an agenda, uh, which he made very clear in his writing, that he was writing to defend the honor and the integrity and the bravery of the Chinese Navy in defeating these pirates. 
And there's a long story behind that, which I'm not going to get into. But essentially, the only other accounts of these pirates had come from British and Portuguese sources, because at the time, uh, there was a Portuguese colony called Macau. So you had a couple of Portuguese ships. Hong Kong had not become a British colony then, but there were some British ships that were based in Macau. And they had engaged in some anti-piracy activities. And so there were a few... Um, <coughs> Kind of military accounts of the pirates by them and and so the portuguese kind of glorified their role the british glorified their role so along came this chinese writer who wanted to defend the role of the chinese navy and in actual fact the chinese navy was not as up upstanding and competent as he put it but in his his history which is very interesting um, the facts, the, the basic facts that he presented actually corresponded with the facts that the British and the Portuguese had given in terms of dates and, and the main events. But in between, this writer <clears throat> invented a lot of conversations and backroom discussions between the pirates and discussions between the different government officials, which he could not possibly have witnessed. And if he had uh, interviewed any eyewitnesses 20 years later, these were the kinds of talks that none of these eyewitnesses would have been privy to either. He just made it up. And of course, I understand why he made it up, which was to help to explain some of the motivations of these people. But nevertheless, it was made up. And that was the only um, narrative account of these pirates that existed. You know, there were, like I said, there were there were isolated accounts of different incidents, but this was the only narrative account that tried to tell the whole story of this band of pirates and their rise and eventual fall. And it was translated into English by a German missionary, and then it kind of fell into obscurity. Then a hundred years later, this article appeared that you can see on the screen. This American journalist named Joseph Gollum um, liked to write these kind of human interest stories about interesting people and events from history that he would publish in pulp detective magazines, such as Flynn's Weekly. And he published this in October 1927, uh, and he called it Mrs. Ching Goes a Pirating. And when I read it, I can see that it's just lifted from this, this uh, short book written by this Chinese historian that was translated into English. And he took that story and exaggerated it further and made up, he invented this whole thing about how when she was taken aboard, she punched out the pirate captain, which was not in the original source. So he turned it into even more fiction, but he presented it as a factual article. And he did not excuse me, he did not cite his source. He cited as his source, his local Chinese laundry man. And, okay, so this kind of racist depiction of Chinese was pretty normal back in the 1920s. And so, you know, as, as cringeworthy as that is, that was, it wasn't anything out of the ordinary to, to characterize Chinese that way. Nevertheless, even in the 1920s, I would have thought you would, you would maybe be a little bit suspicious of having a, a laundryman as your source for a historical document. But yeah. this is what he did, okay? And then, so this article apparently was very popular. He put it into a book of his compiled articles, which were not all about pirates, but just different interesting stories. And that book became a big bestseller. So then here's what sometimes happens in historical research and documentation. Someone must have seen an article like this and then so oh, this is really interesting. I'm going to I'm going to paraphrase it for this this little article for my local magazine. And then someone else comes along, another historian came along and probably didn't base their article on this, but based it on the original source and also made up some things. And um, gosh, I forget his name, but he also published a book of different chapters about different pirates. Um, oh yeah, his name was Joseph. 
Joseph Goss, and he, he published this book about pirates, and he had this one chapter about her, and it was pretty much the same things being told. Mm -hmm. And he made up his own little embellishments, not as bad as this one that, that I'm showing you, but he also embellished it. And he also didn't cite his original source. So then, if you're a scholarly researcher and you're looking into for historical facts to, to support a thesis or, or write another uh, document, you know, the most valuable source is a firsthand source. And in this case, you don't have one. But the next most valuable thing to find are sources that from, di from different authors that describe the same thing and they corroborate each other. And so clearly what happened is that some historian, maybe a history student, found Mrs. Ching goes a pirating, found Joseph Goss's uh, article and said, ooh, they say the same thing. Therefore, the facts must be true. And so then it enters the, the actual scholarly historical uh, universe, and it becomes taken as fact. And this is something that happens all the time. When I was studying back in university, the, the thing I was studying was nothing in Asia. It was about uh, history in, in uh, well, in, in Central Asia. And this happened all the time, and my mentor showed me how it happens. And so the, the story itself was so interesting that I just felt compelled to take it further. And so it became kind of my hobby while I was doing other work to research this story because I wanted for me to find out the truth. So then, so the next thing I did was to look into what were the roots of piracy. And that came out of the boat people community. And I say boat people because they lived in a very separate community. And let me see, I forget my next picture. So this is, this is a, a photo from around the time that I first arrived in Hong Kong, 1985. And you could find all around uh, in different bays and inlets, all these boats. And, and if you see people, there's laundry hanging there and there's people about on the deck. These people live on these boats and they lived separately from the community on land. There was even legends that there were people on these boats in the 1980s who'd, whose feet had never touched solid ground, that they'd spent their whole lives on the boats. I'm not, I think that may have been an exaggeration, but it actually wasn't until a, a local government policy that required education for the kids that even the, some of these kids went to school and, and got educated. And even nowadays, if you go to some of these boating communities, many, a large number of the older people are illiterate because they never went to school. Now, the boat people who were known as Tonka, which was actually a derogatory term, but it's one of those derogatory terms that they adopted. The Tonka historically lived separately. Historically, they were considered almost a separate race. And back then in the 19th century and before, the Tanka were like the untouchables in India. That by national law, they were for, they were the only class of people in all of China who were forbidden from getting an education, forbidden from taking the the uh, civil service exam, which would get you a government job, which was the stepping stone for success for, especially for people from the lower classes in China. So someone from a farming village could feasibly get some money together and get a tutor and get into education and pass this exam and better himself. The only class of people who were forbidden from doing that were the boat people. And these boat people, they lived up and down the coast of China. So they were uh, segregated and they were limited to eking out a living fishing and transporting goods. And fishing is seasonal like everywhere. So maybe six, seven months out of the year, they would, uh, they would go fishing. And then the rest of the time they might uh, transport goods and they would uh, 
and then to make ends meet, a lot of them would engage, would engage in petty piracy during those during the off season. Uh, I forgot to show you this picture. Uh, this is a picture of Tai O, the village I mentioned earlier where my friend lives, and people do still live like this. There were some communities where the boat people did live ashore in these above canals and swampy areas in these stilt houses. And this is how it still looks like this today in parts of there. And so you can see they live along this canal. These houses are raised on stilts, and then they have the boats in front. So, of course, back then they wouldn't have motor boats, but um, this was another way that the boat people lived in certain areas. So piracy, you know, kind of grew up out of this, this uh, you know, this uh, situation where the, uh, the boat people themselves couldn't, uh, often couldn't make ends meet. So they would engage in, uh, you know, in petty piracy. And sometimes they would uh, end up selling their daughters, which is what I believe happened in with uh, this woman, Shek Yang. Another thing I wanted to mention was women's roles in boat people's society. So again, this was something that set them apart. You know, you, you've heard of bound feet by, of women in, in ancient China, and the, the tradition of bound feet wasn't even outlawed until uh, the early 20th century. In fact, I used to see once in a while old women hobbling on bound feet in Hong Kong when I first came here in 1985. But... Um, the boat people, the women didn't bind their feet for kind of practical reasons because they worked and lived aboard ship and there's no way you could walk across a rolling ship deck if you bound your feet. So one, they didn't bind their feet. Secondly, women and children obviously lived aboard the boats because that's where the families lived. So women worked on these boats. It's not like the Western tradition where women would not go aboard. And so you, you rarely had situations where the men would go out fishing for days at a time and the women would wait at home. It just didn't happen that way. And in fact, there was kind of a division of labor. The smaller boats, like you see in this picture, uh, called sampans, were almost always uh, piloted by women, even today. If you go down to areas where the boats are, the smaller boats, it's almost entirely women who run them. So small, medium-sized boats, women in charge, not men. And even for some of the larger boats, it was not that common, but there were women captains. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that common, but when it did happen, it wasn't considered anything really strange. It, mm -hmm. just, uh, it just was not that common. So yep. this, is, this is the flower boat that uh, is in the title. The flower boats were floating brothels, and... This is a photo of one from around 1880 uh, in one of the side canals in Guangzhou. And so you can see it was kind of like a floating barge with this structure on top. And you had in front the um, kind of a reception area where the, the women would hang around and try to beckon in, in uh, customers. And inside, just inside there <coughs> was a... Uh, a little parlor where women in lovely outfits would serve snacks and drinks, and maybe some of them would, would sing or recite poetry. And then uh, the rest of the, the boat was filled with these little curtained off cubicles where the, the real entertainment would go on. And so flower boats were a common sight in just about any coastal city in China. But the most famous ones were in Guangzhou, which is just upriver from where I am right now. And um, now I, okay. They weren't as glamorous as you might think. So this is a, another photo from around that time. And what you see in the upper right, this row of boats with the big openings, those are flower boats. And, and so it was, a bit seedier than the name implies. So in the foreground are a lot of different sampans. And so men would come along in groups and hire a sampan that would bring them out into the middle of the river where they would cruise down the line of flower boats and, uh, you know, kind of 
judge them for their various uh, uh, things on offer. So this this is one line of flower boats. This is the the most famous area right in the center of town had two rows of 14 flower boats on each side facing each other. And you can see the sampan pulled up there. I think this is a daytime picture when they weren't as busy, but this is essentially how they looked. And the uh, and this is where the Yang, the, my protagonist, most likely worked. We don't know exactly which one she worked on, or even if it was in Guangzhou, but it seemed the most likely because she was from this region. And we, and from what I could gather and reconstruct, the most likely scenario is that she was sold by her family because they were in financial straits. And in any case, in China, girls were <clears throat> considered less valuable than boys. And, you know, you'd, put all the money and resources into raising a girl, then she'd go get married and then she would <clears throat> move in and work for another family. So it seemed like a, girls were considered a poor investment. So selling a girl, if you needed money, was uh, a sadly all too common thing all across China and uh, including among the boat people. And so here's a close up of one of them. You can see how ornately carved the fronts were. So it was like, you know, it was like brothels in, in many places. They put up this really glamorous front. Um, so this this was where she probably worked. And so I, I spent a lot of years, I mean, many years, kind of on the side as my hobby, trying to reconstruct the life of this woman, Cheng Yat So. So to, just to give you some orientation, you can see this map on the right is the, the coast of China and Vietnam. And I think maybe it's a bit hard to read. I don't know if my cursor shows up on the screen sharing, but um, you can kind of see it pretty much in the center of the map. That's the, the mouth of the Pearl River, and that's where most of the action in this story takes place. And it does involve going all the way down to Vietnam, which is why this is in the map. On the left is the Pearl River Delta. And the... Uh, so she was born in, in 1775 in this village called Sunwoi, which is on the left side of the map on the left, um, in this kind of delta area. And from there, if she, she was taken aboard to Guangzhou, which is up at the top of the map. And the pirates themselves at this time didn't have any particular base. Um, and so they kind of roamed this whole region. She joined the pirates by whatever means in 1801 when she was 26. And again, there's only some very sparse information specifically about her. So I had my challenge as a historical researcher was to piece together this story without having any real, uh, a lot of firsthand resources about her or these pirates. So I had to kind of extrapolate, triangulate, gather all different kinds of facts and, and things to put them together to construct the most plausible story that I could about what she did. And so this led for me to some big discoveries. Now, by this time, I'd made contact with several historians who were experts on Chinese maritime history and the history of this region. And they had helped me by giving me access to quite a few documents in Chinese and in English um, that they'd used in their own research. But I found, for example, my, my big discovery, I found in a footnote in one scholarly article, not even in the middle of the article, there was a footnote that on such and such date, these pirates were spotted in the Spirit River in central Vietnam. If you look on the map on the right, uh, if you can read it, there's a, it shows the Spirit River, which is down in the center of Vietnam, and it's no longer called the Spirit River, but at the time that was the name in Vietnamese. And that was the only mention of it. Now, we know around that time, the, there was a civil war going on in Vietnam, and the, the rulers who were based in the north had a navy, but they had, they, it wasn't very effective. And so they recruited 
Chinese pirates to form a mercenary navy for them. Now, this is documented. There was a saying back then that the, the Vietnamese made great ships and terrible sailors. And it seemed to be true. They made these beautiful ships out of solid mahogany, but the sailors were not up to par. So they hired these tough, rough men who were, uh, who were experienced at fighting and who would work for money and who else but pirates. And so the pirates themselves formed a separate mercenary navy to support the, uh, the imperial side in the north. And we don't know a lot more than that, except they were based in this border town be right between Vietnam and China. And then, again, this one mention they were seen in the Spirit River. And so I needed to know more. So I looked for Vietnamese sources. Of course, I don't speak Vietnamese, so I had to find English sources, and I found some. And I was able to piece together a lot of interesting facts. I looked up the date they were found in the Spirit River, and that date was the the day before Chinese New Year, which is called Tet in Vietnam. Well, that was significant because in the Vietnamese sources, I read that there was a battle the next day in that river. And furthermore, I found in another Chinese or Vietnamese history that the emperor himself had traveled to the Spirit River to throw a Chinese New Year or Tet banquet for his troops that were camped along this river. And along with him came a, a general, I don't want to spoil the story, but the, a general with some very interesting characteristics who was also at this river. And it made me think, in this mercenary navy, Yang had been married to this, this pirate captain that she was forced into marriage. And again, backtracking, but I, I won't go into detail. I ha I constructed reconstructed reasons plausible to me why she would have eventually accepted that status. Now, when they became a mercenary Navy, now suddenly she was the wife of an admiral. He was either the second or third ranking admiral in this mercenary Navy. <clears throat> so it stands to reason that she had been a guest at this banquet with the emperor at the Spirit River. And it gave me kind of an insight into her character. Imagine how this woman must have felt. She'd grown up as an illiterate, poor fisherman's daughter, sold into slavery, kidnapped by pirates, had gotten all the worst that life could dole out to her. And here she was, an, an admiral's wife dining with royalty. Imagine how she must have felt, how she had come up in the world. And then, that night, and I will spoiled this part of the story. That night, there was a surprise attack by the rebel forces. And the and it says in the Vietnamese history that the, the naval forces in the river were severely damaged, many ships destroyed and burned, and the rest escaped. And the next mention we see in any of the histories is that these pirates were then spotted in Chinese waters about three months later. So I put all these things together and created what I considered a very plausible scenario of her involvement in this Navy, in this battle, in the, the, the uh, royalty and these generals that she must have met, and thinking about how she must have felt to be so elevated, and then to lose it all overnight after this defining battle, which which finally defeated the imperial forces and the pirates all fled. So for one thing, I went to my historian uh, friends and said, look what I found, look what I put together. Am I allowed to even say this? I don't have a, I don't have the credentials. And, and one guy who was a professor of history told me, you made a discovery, Larry. He said, you know, we don't know everything yet. That's why we still have historians. And you took all these pieces that were there in plain sight, but no one, including me, had put together, and you put them together. So you have a discovery. Congratulations. And so that gave me, that really boosted my confidence, and it gave me a boost into the idea of turning this into a book. And on top of that, it gave me this, this um, insight into her personality, how 
she as a person must have felt. Um, now, when they returned to China, the pirates, they went back to being pirates, to just petty piracy and, and robbing ships and raiding coastal villages. It wasn't a, a really glamorous life. They didn't make a lot of money. But uh, within a, a couple of years after that, the pirates formed a massive confederation. All these different pirate groups that were operating uh, kind of freelance up and down the coast formed this confederation where they cooperated, where they set up a series of protection passes, very much like organized criminals in the West nowadays. You know, they sell protection. You pay money every year or every so often, and no one's going to bother you. And so this is what they started doing. Instead of raiding villages, instead of robbing ships, they sold them passes, which were recognized by all of the pirate gangs up and down the coast. And it actually brought a kind of peace to the coast. These, All these captains, all these villages were happy to pay these protection fees if it meant they could then operate in peace and not have their goods stolen from them. And I contemplated who was behind this, because her husband, what we know of him, came from this old pirating dynasty. His father, his, his you could trace him back about six generations, all of whom were pirates, and none of them had ever come up with this idea. And for various reasons, it just occurred to me that maybe this was her idea. After all, she'd lived her entire youth in the city, among these business-minded flower boat owners. And I'm convinced that it was her influence that got them to form this confederation with her husband at the head of it. And when he died, again, giving away a little bit, but this is you'll find this out easily if you just look her up online. When he died, she then took over. Now, I told you there were pirate captains who were not pirate, there were ship captains who were women. But this was kind of unprecedented. All these different pirate gangs had been operating in this region for a long time. All these various captains of these gangs were these very powerful men, each of whom had a very valid reason to believe that he was the rightful heir to this confederation's leadership when when this, <coughs> this man Cheng Yat died. And yet, Somehow they deferred to her. So again, it gave me insight into her. She must have been very charismatic and extremely intelligent. And perhaps it was her years as a prostitute. She knew how to read men. She knew how to manipulate men. And she worked her way into this position of authority, which was never challenged uh, for the remainder of the these pirates' reign along the coast. And so this personality began to form. Well, this is uh, this I, I forgot to mention. This is just some uh, the types of ships that were the pirates would have uh, sailed in the the Vietnamese style of ships that these pirates actually used. Because when they left Vietnam, of course, they took the ships with them. Um, and yeah, I've not been paying attention to my slideshow. This is an old uh, painting of this battle. This uh, surprise attack in the Spirit River that was done by. Well, it's Chinese beautiful, beautiful painting. painting. <laughs> yeah, uh, so it's a you know it's it's an imagining of this mm -hmm. battle that was going on. So this was meant to illustrate showing the pirates back in the Chinese waters. This is a photo from actually from the 1930s. So here I was trying to. I love this image. This actually, I found this online, this cartoon image of her. The outfit's not that bad in terms of authenticity. And so, um, this was to illustrate another incident, but I think I'm running out of time, so I'm not going to talk about it. Um, but You're all set to go. We're, we're good okay. for another well, 30 minutes. So <laughs> All right, so this was another incident that gave me some insight into her character. This was an earlier incident, which is described in the, in the book, where um, the pirate, this was maybe just a few months after she was abducted, and it was the day before 
the Moon Festival. And guess what? The Moon Festival is tomorrow. So we're at the same date, 100 and something years later, or 200 and something years later. So these pirates were seen gathering off this island on such and such date. Again, there was no identification that it was the day before the Moon Festival. And so there was uh, one report from some Chinese report that they were seen gathering off this island and performing <clears throat> a ritual where they would buy these caged roosters and let them free on this island. This is kind of a Buddhist ritual where you're trying to earn karma by freeing a caged animal. And they still do things like that today. And of course it was a lucrative business because then after you'd free these roosters, the people who sold them would then come along to the island, grab them again, put them in cages and sell them to the next people who wanted to improve their karma. But nevertheless, the pirates were seen doing this. And then you find another report where the next day um, there was a storm which wrecked a lot of the boats because like in this photo, um, they, were, they were anchored quite close together and a sudden storm came and the, they didn't have time to get away. They were packed so close together that many ships got wrecked. So anyway, I put, I put together the story and figured out what was going on. Again, I looked up in my old calendar and found out that this was the day before the Moon Festival. The Moon Festival, or Mid-Autumn Festival, is a festival where th that evening you're supposed to go out and gaze at the moon and have feasts of sweets and fruits and there's drinking and it, so it's it's a very festive holiday which is it's mainly a feasting holiday and people do get drunk and so it was really kind of obvious and again this was never referred to in any of the histories the pirates must have been gathering on this island near which happened to be very near a major salt port now salt was a very expensive commodity back then and so salt would be brought in from various sources on barges into these ports from which it would be sold onward to be transported inland. So they were clearly gathering with the intention of hijacking some salt barges, which is something they often did so they could steal the salt. And their obvious plan was hide out on, behind this island, which was out of view of the salt port, wait until all the people in the town got drunk on the moon festival evening and then go in when they're sleeping off their drink go in in the morning and steal these barges that was the obvious plan and then this uh this storm came in and wrecked their boats and in fact some people came in from the land after having discovered this plot and and to add insult to injury to the pirates they attacked them and, and killed quite a few of them and the pirates left then I found one mention, which may or may not be reliable, <clears throat> that there was a formal wedding between Yang and this man who had kidnapped her and declared her his wife. Now, why am I mentioning this? Because, first of all, <clears throat> this was another incident where I could put together the whole picture of them coming in, performing this ritual, waiting out for the, the moon festival evening with the intention of raiding this port and then being undermined by the weather. So I put that together. Uh, that was easy. <clears throat> but then there was a formal wedding. So again, I, I did a lot of thinking, contemplating about this. And hopefully my wife, who is Chinese, is also a clinical psychologist. So a lot of times I'd go to her and say, okay, here's this incident, that incident. What's the personality type? What's the connection? And so it occurred to me that there was something that happened around then that made her probably realize there's no going back. And as long as there's no going back, let's make this marriage formal. Because why else would there be a formal wedding months and months after she was abducted? Um, you know, in formal weddings, well, I mean, not, not to be sexist about it, but this is more often to, you know, to please the women than, than men often, and these kind of men would not necessarily have th thought that a formal wedding was important. So something changed her mind, something changed her perspective. 
And this I won't give away. It's in the book. And I came up with what I thought was a plausible reason for her to realize that there's no going back. Uh, then there's even a, a saying among the Chinese boat people, you can't sail backwards, which I quote in the book. And so this is the kind of for, historical forensics that I engaged in. So I, I didn't know what I was doing with this, with this research. I'd never written a book like this. Well, I had written something back in university, but in the intervening years, I hadn't done anything like this. And I still wasn't sure what to do with it. And I kept complaining to my wife, you know, I'd, I'd keep doing this research. I'd say, oh, here's a really interesting thing. Help me figure out about her personality. My gosh, where's the book about her? My wife finally said, shut up about where's there a book about her. You have to write a book. And then a very serendipitous thing happened. Because again, I was feeling a bit unsure of what to do. I couldn't write a, a biography because there were just too many holes in the actual verifiable history. <clears throat> so a lot of these things, like I said, I was filling in through conjecture by looking at similar incidents that happened and, and kind of piecing them together into this plausible story. Um, <clears throat> and, but it, so it couldn't be a biography uh, unless I really had a lot of disclaimers every step of the way. And that would have been annoying. So then one day my wife and I were on a hike. Now this is an, an old map of Lantau Island, the island where I live. And again, I don't think my pointer is visible to you, but we live on the kind of the eastern side of the island. Um, and <clears throat> often we would take a walk to the north central part. You can see in the north central part, there's this little kind of triangular shaped island right off the the North Coast, which is called Czechlap Cock, that's where the airport is nowadays. But that's the area where the pirates eventually set up a base. So we often like to hike from our village over to, to that side of the island. You're walking through total wilderness. There's, there's maybe one or two houses along the way. The rest of the time, it's just this footpath. There's no cars, just a footpath and through this beautiful wilderness until you come out at the other end. And it's about a two hour hike. So we're, we'd walked this so many times. One day we decided to take this little side trail and see where that led us. <clears throat> and so we went on this trail, it was a steep downhill and the trail just ended. And we couldn't retrace our steps because it was so steep going up and it was very sandy and we just couldn't make any progress going uphill. So we decided to try to feel our way to this village called Tong Chung, and we got totally lost in this dense forest. And we couldn't even see which, couldn't tell which direction we were going. Finally, luckily, we came across this old lady who was gathering twigs in the, and, and branches in baskets. And it's like right out of one of Grimm's fairy tales. This old, old woman hunched over. So we went up to her and asked, we said, we're lost. Can you point us the way to Tung Chung? And she said, oh, yeah, okay. Um, here, help me carry my baskets. I'll walk you back to my village. And we'll, uh, and then I'll point you the way to Tung Chung from there. So we did so. Along the way, my wife asked her how old she was. She was uh, late 80s, still very active. As soon as I heard her age, a calculator went off in my head because I figured she was a young girl in the 1930s. In the 1930s was the last big wave of piracy in this region. This island, Lantau Island, was a total backwater. There were no road here. There was no regular ferry service. It was just a few villages spread around. And back then, there, there were pirates based nearby who raided these villages and caused a lot of mayhem until the British finally, the British Navy came along and finally cleared them out. So I asked this woman, did you ever see any pirates? And she said to me, how does a foreigner know about the pirates? And she had actually been uh, a victim of a pirate raid. She grew up in a small village on the north coast of this island and pirates came in on sailing junks and they 
they anchored their ships and they waded ashore and they came in and they started looting. They started grabbing women and girls and young boys to, to bring them out onto the ship and hold them hostage. Houses were burning. Her mother finally grabbed her and hid her under the, the kitchen stove so that she wouldn't be taken. And she told me all these details of this actual pirate raid. And it was like golden for me because I could imagine that things weren't all that different in 1930 as they were back in 1801 in this part of the coast because it was such a backwater then. And because these weren't motorized modern ships, these were old sailing junks still. And so I had all this detail and chapter one of my book opens with a pirate raid and almost every detail in there comes word for word from this, what this old women to told me. So I knew from there I had to write a book. And that, that is um, how it started. And so just briefly, um, this, this is how that village would have looked at the time that I went there. This is a, a shot from on top of a mountain peak. Now there's an airport there. And there's a bridge that links this to the mainland. But this is where the pirates had uh, had based themselves. You can see some ships out there in the middle of the bay, not pirates. This photo was taken in the 1930s after the pirate uh, had been cleared out. But this is just, uh, this is what it looked like. And so I immersed myself. I found this old junk where the uh, the owners were very happy to let me explore on board. Uh, this is the cabin, the type of cabin that she would have lived in. This is the entrance to the cabin. And there's this cramped little cabin inside where I sat there for hours one day, just yeah. trying to feel what it was like in this cramped little quarters. So small that that's why you see my leg in the picture. I couldn't even get my leg out of the way to take this picture. And in fact, even near my village, here's this is a watchtower that locals had built as a watchtower to look out for pirates. Wow. And so, um, again, I, there were all these little bits of history around me that I could go to to try to get a, a feeling for what things were like. Um, I'm not sure why I put this in here. But I then found a mentor who's a historical novelist and, and tried to figure out, well, how do you write this? How, how can you, how much can you make up, I asked her, when you're writing right. historical fiction, especially because I wanted to tell the true story, but I had to tell it as a novel because I was more interested in, in, in exploring her character mm -hmm. than in simply just telling the facts. So the first rule that she taught me, well, first of all, to clarify my own, uh, my own motivations, Toni Morrison said this, if there's a book you want to write and it hasn't been written yet, then you have to write it. And so that's what I was doing. But so then what you can do, this is what my mentor, the, not Donald Barthelm, but this was the thing that from another author that she quoted, don't contradict what is known. So what that means is you don't change history. You know, you don't change the order of historical facts, even if it would make a, a more dramatic story. And the things that you make up should be plausible. So instead of taking, a, making up a character and inserting her into events, I let the events help me and my, with my help of my psychologist wife, form the character. And when there were events that had to be invented, including the raid that opens the story, it had to be something that was plausible, taken from other sources, or, or, using the best of my knowledge to to make those things up. And so, you know, then the question is, is a novel therefore less true than a history book? And so, I my mentor found this other quote for me. The historian will tell you what happened, the novelist will tell you what it felt like by Yale Doctorow, an American novelist who was very successful writing, his, writing his historical fiction. And so that's all I really wanted to tell you about my book. I went on a bit longer than I expected, but I, I just wanted to give you some idea of the background to her. If you want to read a few articles that I've written about some of the historical background, you can go to this website and take a look. 
Um, and I, I hope you found this interesting that, uh, this, this kind of unique and to me, extremely fascinating story of this woman who came from such low circumstances and became such a powerful figure, someone who, although she was a criminal, I, I just had to admire what she was able to make of her life. And within the context, I, I really do find her a very admirable figure. And so thank you very much for your attention. And oh, thank you. Thank you. If you have any Excellent. questions, I'm thank very you. happy to, to answer them. Yeah. Um, does anybody have any questions? Uh, well, uh, as somebody who comes from history, uh, studying history myself, I can relate very much to that historical writing process of just finding that one little citation and kind of following it as to where it goes. Um, and it, it's kind of that exciting, exciting thrill that you get when you start kind of piecing things together. It's quite exciting. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, well, yeah, I mean, uh, I had a list of questions over here, but a lot of them were answered in the presentation. Oh, okay. <laughs> it was great. It was wonderful. It was wonderful. Um, but one question I had, um, uh, that I that I had written down. Uh, how long did how long did this uh, take to uh, to research and put all together? Um, you said that you were kind of doing it as a hobby, but when you kind of sat down and started putting all that evidence together, how long did it kind of take take you? This was a twelve year process for me. I first learned about the story in um, around two thousand eight, and I spent five years just on the research. And then about seven years, writing it and rewriting it and throwing it all out and starting all over as I was, you know, when, when, you, when you write any sort of material, but especially fiction, you kind of discover the story the more you write it. And so it, it took, let me stop sharing the screen. Um, let me see. I'm we have about three minutes left on the timer okay. but if we want to all we have to do is just re-click the link and we can we can come back to come back to this so looking at it okay. so don't feel I'm rushed to... <laughs> yeah Apple, maybe you can question. Um, yes you were talking about um mandarin versus cantonese do you speak those languages having lived there so long yeah i do um i speak uh how do i end Maybe you, oh, here we go. Stop the share. Okay. Yeah, I, well, I live in a Cantonese speaking place and my wife's a Cantonese native speaker. Yeah, I speak Cantonese. I learned Mandarin, I'm not very good at it, but I learned enough to get by if I travel in China. So, but that helped. I don't read them very well. I can't read the original sources, but it did help me. My reading helped me in, in interpreting maps and things like that. Mm -hmm. So not being able to read it well did hinder me a bit, but my wife was a great help. And some of my historian uh, contacts were a great help in, in translating some of the documents. I mean, interesting, of course, as I was researching about pirates, I did read about the Western pirates. And, you know, I guess in your area, there's a bit of pirate history too. Oh yeah, so, we we got uh, and they mythologize it. There's a bit of mythologizing with it too. Um, I mean, locally around here in Edenton, they uh, Blackbeard Blackbeard is kind of the uh, local local guy that came in and was down in Bath for a while. But there's a persisting belief around town that he married Governor Eden's daughter, and they have a oh. illegitimate child or something, which is not true but it's a bit of mythology that's kind of put into the town with some places um but it, it's certainly interesting and i mean they had you know um the history of of western piracy really uh when you do do the uh you know kind of looking at the history of it it's fascinating how it changed over from a privateer sort of army to a pro to pirate to piracy One of the histor uh, when i was in graduate school um we really talked about the process of why piracy kind of had occurred um and they had explained that 
there was already a system in place of mark of you know ships going up and down the coast and for the british navy it took quite a bit of money to go out there to kind of police those waters because mm-hmm. you have to think late 1600s early 1700s that area of the world was just frontier yeah. and so when the british ended up getting into a war uh with the spanish and the french and they had their armies going on about there which was costing the spanish and the french quite a large penny quite a pretty penny um the uh british just turned to their local merchants already said all right here's a contract go get them for us yeah and they just used that economic system to their advantage and it didn't cost the british nearly as much as it would have if they sent all of their ships out there when the war was over all those privateering contracts uh, contracts evaporated and so what they said is well we like doing this profession it was quite lucrative so we're just going to continue doing it with all vessels <laughs> yeah that's a little bit similar to what happened with the chinese pirates although they had been pirates beforehand oh yeah but you know interesting comparison though <clears throat> and this is another thing that's kind of curious to me is that you know if you just ask anyone particularly in the west about who was the most powerful, fearsome pirate of all, Mm -hmm. most people would say Blackbeard. Oh, yeah. (laughs) Now, Blackbeard, normally, uh, at most, he had five ships. Mm -hmm. I think think there was one engagement where he had 20 ships that he was commanding and maybe about 500 men. Yeah. Cheng Yat-so, his Mm -hmm. Chinese pirate queen, commanded 1,500 ships and 18,000 men at the height of her power. She was the most powerful pirate in history. Oh, yeah. And yet yet you hardly ever hear about her, which is really kind of interesting. Oh, yeah. And that's the beauty of of learning about world history. You just find, you know, we're so caught up in kind of the normal narrative of things. It's easy to forget about people like this who made such a huge impact in that region. Um, And really you know are truly truly the original (laughs) original pirate the the one who had all the power i mean a lot of people i mean there's a misconception of what piracy is we all we all have this idea of that they're this golden age pirate when you can consider the vikings pirates because that's what they were they were private privately done people that were going out to raid the coasts of villages and take over ships for financial gain yeah. Um, and uh, as a part of uh, the library's theme this month, we've been kind of highlighting the different pirates throughout history. Um, one of the videos that we just released um, was about the Sea Peoples, and they would be considered uh, oh, pirates. Yeah. yeah, the Bronze Age collapse. Right. And I mean, we don't know a heck of a lot about them, but it seems like they might have been part of that already established economic system. Um, and it's, it's just fascinating when you really get to digging into where all these different, uh, you know, presence of pirates are all around the globe. And I find that not only is uh, Cheng Ye Sao's uh, story just kind of, she just wasn't the most powerful pirate in the world. She was a woman. <laughs> yeah. And for that time period, it was just, it's astounding. Yeah. And well, there were Western pi- women pirates, mm-hmm. um, but um, and I don't know that much about them, mm-hmm. but th- they certainly didn't have that kind of power or prominence, yeah. In the region, they, yeah, you know, they, but, um... and Bonnie, I think, was one, and so they had some, uh, you know, it's interesting. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> and one of these days, I may look into it, but uh. Mm. But I, I'm still kind of um, focused on these Chinese pirates. In fact, the book is only half the story. I'm working on the sequel now. Oh, fantastic! Yeah, I was going to ask. I was going to ask what what you were. Um, I mean, ended off of, and it, well, I'm not going to spoil anything, but it ended off of just kind of part A of her life, and yeah. then part B of it was coming uh, would be uh, part B, part A of her pirate experience, and then part B of her pirate experience. Um, That's essentially, very, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the first book's about her rise. The second book is about her, not her fall, but her, her basically her struggle with power. Yeah, and, and learning how to how manage. To, 
wield power mm -hmm. and um, some very interesting things. Well, actually quite dramatic things that she yeah. ended up doing at the end of her career. Mm -hmm. Already I'm finding some interesting side stories out of this. There was, um, she had among some of the captives, they, they did occasionally have Western captives. In this book, there, there's a mention of a man named John Turner, an Englishman, and some of his uh, shipmates who have been captured. And in the second book, there's also some. There were actually a group of American sailors that uh, were captured and held for ransom and released shortly after because they did get paid. But among them was a 13-year-old a Dutch boy that they'd been transporting who... Um, because he wasn't part of the American crew, no one paid for his release. So he's ended up staying with these pirates for a year and a half. And he learned to speak fluent Cantonese. And he kind of, and she kind of adopted him mm -hmm. as a pet, in a way, this cute little blonde boy. And uh, he went on actually to do some things because he'd learned Chinese. When he finally was released, instead of going back to Holland, he joined this group in Guangzhou and became uh, one of the first. He became, <clears throat> became part of a group that were the first to translate the Bible into Chinese. And so they oh, grabbed wow. him because of his Chinese uh, language abilities. So he has a really interesting story. So that's going to be book three. Oh, there you go. Uh, I'm, I'm going to be really busy. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> it's always interesting to find those little cases when you start digging into stuff and you find uh, find all sorts of interesting characters and people who ended up kind of really contributing to world history. Um, with, were there other any any other characters that kind of, uh, well, individuals, not characters, individuals that kind of popped up along the way that seemed rather interesting? Well, there's a lot of great characters, but the ones that really uh, appealed to me most <clears throat> were this central core group of, uh, of pirates. Well, actually, I mean, yeah. In, again, in my side research, looking at Vietnamese history, I found um, a story of these two sisters, Vietnamese sisters, who were daughters of an emperor who between them married three emperors. Oh, wow. And one of them had a very happy marriage. And yeah. when her husband died, she just never recovered from it. Yeah. And the other had a miserable marriage. Oh, <laughs> and they're both sisters. And it's like a fairy tale almost. So yeah. I don't know. That That's going to take a lot of research into Vietnamese history. And they're, oh. they're, they are known in, in Vietnamese kind of... Uh, you know, folk tales, there's folk songs about them and stories, but I, I couldn't find mention even in Vietnamese of any book about them. Yeah. So that also seems kind of like an attractive story to look into because it oh, was real. Yeah. Oh, yeah. And it, it's, it's, and it's it, around the same time we're talking about because oh. one interesting part is this, this emperor that the pirates were working for was 18 years old. Oh, yeah. <laughs> when his father died, he became emperor as, as a, like a 12 year old. Yeah. And he married this girl that, you know, they was matched, right? That he was mm -hmm. told to marry this girl who had been one of these princesses. And their capital was in Hue in central Vietnam. And when this, this uh, rebellion broke out, um, the the rebels advanced so quickly that the royal family fled Hue to what's now Hanoi, basically in the middle of the night. And they left this, the, the queen behind, yeah. this emperor's wife, left her behind. Oh, wow. And she was stuck there. And then she became captive of the new, the rebel leader. The rebel leader won and he be declared himself emperor and he married her. <laughs> and so again, I mean, so interesting. What a, what a great story. And oh. apparently with him, she had a great marriage. Oh, wow. <laughs> it was her sister who had the lousy marriage to someone else. Yeah. It's oh, uh, really uh, interesting. Oh, yeah. That's, that's the thing I love reading about history. When you get across those just kind of human tales that kind of yeah. pop up. Um, I mean, one thing that 
is ap apropos for having a psych psychologist perspective. Um, when I was studying underwater archaeology, they said one thing that was a proven fact of human behavior in old sailing was the idea of one more time around for a ship. And ships mm. would go across the Atlantic or across the Pacific. And essentially the, the crews were trying to get as much bang out of the buck as they could. And when they would find these ships, they'd find that they were already well damaged. So that one last time was truly the last time <laughs> that they went down. Oh. And you just have those human stories and history and uh, moments that come out and such things. Mm. Mm. And, and it's just kind of one of those universal things that it's not just in the Atlantic, but also in the Pacific too, and along the Indian coast. So, or Indian ocean. Yeah. One more time. Or I'm going to have to make a note of that. Yeah. Cause that's essentially what happened also in, in this case, it's in this book. Yeah. But where, uh, you, spoke of the, you spoke of the woman who was like in her eighties that had actually witnessed a um, pirate attack something when she was young. Did you tell her what you were trying to do about writing the story and, and what, yeah. was, what was her opinion? Did she think that yeah. was a good idea or? The way I remember it, she just kind of, you know, laughed and, and waved her hand at me. It's like, um, you know, to her, it was, it was a, a dreadful memory from childhood. And, uh, you know, I did explain to her that I'm considering writing this book. And that's why I wanted all this detail from her. So mm -hmm. she was cooperative, but I don't think she necessarily found the found it all that interesting that I was writing a book about it. You know, yeah, just, I, was, I was trying to compare it to the Somali pirates and just kind yeah. of, you know, as modern day and how um, Captain Richard Phillips was held hostage and yeah, how it just uh, it it seems like we um, when it's modern day. It seems scarier, whereas when it's 1800s or 1700s, it's more like a. Uh, even even the facts seem more like fiction, and it seems just more glamorized. I know. Well, in fact, you know, I I did do a bit of studying about the Somali pirates because I, I wanted to know their motivations too, and I think you're right. It's more dangerous nowadays just because of the weapons and the technology, and they have these high speed boats, but. You know, they, you know, even back then in, in the 19th century, they did torment their captives when they felt it was justified. And I, and it was a horrifying experience for the, anyone who was held captive by these pirates. But when it comes down to it, you know, in a way it was a similar thing. The Somalis, they kidnap people because they want to get a ransom. And they want ransom for the people and for the ships. And in that way, nothing's changed. Mm -hmm. And and the Somalis too, they've turned it into an industry. Mm -hmm. And and in way in a way that hasn't changed either. You know, they're based in these places on the coast, and that's that's their form of income is piracy. Mm -hmm. So it's uh yeah, it is very scary, but it's in that way, things just haven't changed because they're poor people. And, and to them, they can justify it by saying, we live in poverty. And so this is our way of kind of evening the score. It's yeah, it's always it, and it's a profession that's been around for thousands of years. Um, I mean, it's they're they're scary dudes, <laughs> dudes and, gir and, guy, mm -hmm. and girls. The I mean, another thing to think about, too, is Think about these Somali pirates. You and I would never glamorize them, mm -hmm. right? They're 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 really repulsive in in so many ways because of what they do and how they do it. And so that's how people would have viewed the pirates in this part of the world in China at that time with that same attitude. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure that's how they viewed the pirates along your part of the coast at that time. I don't I don't know. Maybe some people would have glamorized them. I don't know. Yeah, it's they uh, I mean, it's it's easy to reflect back upon history and have that kind of historical distance with you and, you know, with you. And I mean, as you have in your writing, those few cases of people 
uh, well, in your research of a few people trying to romanticize what had happened uh, with Chung, uh, with uh, Chung Yi Sao and some of the yeah. Southeast Asian pirates. Um, I mean, there's always that re- looking back and kind of thinking, oh, it seems like a kind of a glorious life. But I mean, at the end of the day, they're, they're just robbers in boats. Yeah. <laughs> They're robbers in boats who might murder you if you don't give them what they want, <laughs> you know? Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it's quite fascinating and everything, but uh, yeah, well, um, I mean, if anybody else has any more questions, um, I'm sure you're busy and it's just beginning of day for you. I don't want to keep you, keep you from, from anything. Well, that's fine. I, <clears throat> I'm fine. But, um, thank yeah. you for your time. It was an excellent talk. Presentation. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, you for so sticking much. all the way through to the end. No problem. <clears throat> thank you so much. Thank you. And I'm sorry about the technical glitches here. Zoom is a bit, they have this weird 40 limit, 40 minute limit that is just relatively new. So <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. It kind of caught me by surprise. <laughs> um, well, but thank you so uh, much for, for, uh, for doing this uh, research and talking with us about it. Um, I certainly well, enjoyed reading your book and doing the research about uh, hearing all your research and everything on this topic. As somebody who studied history, um, I appreciate the amount of work that's gone into it. And I I know that it's always interesting to get into those rabbit holes of seeing where stuff takes you and how yeah. you have to put yourself in, in their place. But, well, thank you so much. We, we really appreciated your, your, uh, your time and your patience with us. And Thank you. Thank you so much again. Well, thank you. I mean, I, I really appreciate you inviting me. It's really special to me to be invited to speak to people on the other side of the world from me about this topic. It's a very unique experience for me, too, so I appreciate it. Well, thank you. Thank you. And, uh, well, we will uh, we'll get those videos to you. And um, Okay. Yeah, and, uh, well, if, if, you, if anybody wants to learn more about what... Uh, uh, Mr. Fain is doing. Uh, where where can people reach you, uh, in terms of like your social? Well, I gave media? you, the, I gave you that website, piratequeenbook.com. If if you want to ask me any questions, there's an email link on there, mm-hmm. um, and you can you can write to me if you like. You can check out the book from the library and read it, mm-hmm. and um, yeah, you know, and let me know what you think. Yeah. I'm I'm always interested in hearing from people and I I yeah. if it's a legitimate message I'll reply. Yeah. <laughs> I always do. Um and so, you know, I'd be really happy to hear from you and and engage in any discussion. Yeah. To me it's 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 my passion and I really enjoy sharing what I know about it. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Thank you for sharing this with us. It's really really cool (laughs) and really really is cool um yeah thank you and uh i think this will will conclude our thing for the day and uh you have a good good day and we'll have a good evening over here yeah (laughs) and uh i'll send that stuff over to you and if there's anything else you need just send us an email um and uh you know you and for everybody out there if you need to reach us just reach out to the turtle county public library at 252 uh, 796-3771 or just drop by the front desk and we'll help you out as best we can uh, with what resources we have in the library and we can also show you uh, Mr. Fain's book if you if you want to read it so yeah but thank you again thank you so much Mr. Okay. Fain thank you all right thank Thanks. you bye-bye okay bye-bye, bye-bye.